Hi, this is Scott Lancer, the Director of Associates for Biblical Research, and we're here today for another episode of Digging for Truth. And I'm here with my co-host, Henry Smith. And uh, Henry, uh, welcome. It's good to have you today. Good to see you, Scott. Always great to be together in the studio. Absolutely. Uh, one, sort of one-on-one, -on -one, as it were. Yes, yes, indeed. Henry, uh, today it's going to be, uh, well, we're going to have three episodes uh, on the subject of a project that you've been working on for over six years. Um, and it is the Genesis 5 and 11 chronology project with implications for the Genesis flood. Yes. And uh, so today we're introducing the kicking that off with this episode. Uh, and Henry, this has been a labor of love for you. Um, <laughs> And, Certainly uh, has. Yes, uh, a lot of time, a lot of commitment to this project. Yes. Uh, could you just kind of introduce our viewers today to the to the goals of the sure. Genesis 5 and 11 project? Yeah, it's kind of fun for me. You know, uh, we've done many episodes, and I've been been a host and talked about other projects in the ministry, which of course I'm familiar with. But you know, a chance to sit here and talk about my own research project is kind of kind of fun for me. We've, we've touched on little bits and pieces in some of our episodes in the past, but we really haven't discussed it. So what we're talking about is, uh, as a starting point, uh, those are familiar with the early chapters of Genesis, we have two genealogies, one in Genesis 5. Uh, it extends from Adam down to Noah's father, Lamech, in Genesis 5.31. And then in the post-flood period, we have a genealogy that starts with Shem, who's the son of Noah, and goes down extends down to uh, Terah, who is the father of Abraham, and then we have the narrative of Abraham after that. So, um, so that's the really broad picture of it. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in the King James, it was the famous begats, you know, so-and-so beget, so-and-so beget, so-and-so beget, so-and-so. But we have a lot more in the text than just the uh, famous begats or fathered in some of the interpretations. And so these uh, verses uh, historically have been translated um, as texts that you could calculate a chronology from this time period. Yes. So from Adam to the flood, and then from the flood to Abraham. Uh, really, there's a probably over a 2,000 year consensus on this uh, that you could interpret those texts chronologically. I became interested in, in this because in the modern day that, re, that view has been rejected by certainly critical scholars, mm. but also within the church. Um, and so uh, many years ago, I became interested in it. But I, at the time, it was 20 years ago, literally 20 years ago, I became interested. But I didn't have the training to study the Hebrew and the Greek text yeah. and all those other kind of things. So what we're looking at is a, an extensive study of these two genealogies and its relationship to Abraham um, and this epoch, if you will, or two epochs, really, one from Adam to the flood, and then the other from the flood to Abraham. And so that's sort of the big picture overview of, of, what, we're, yeah. of what we're looking at as far as the research goes. Yeah, and, and the, the thing about this is, um, uh, you know, when I became a Christian, I want, well, actually before I became a Christian, one of the first things I did as the Lord was drawing me to himself was I opened up the book uh, of Genesis and I began reading from the beginning of the Bible. They always tell you that, that could be a mistake. But I started that, that yeah. read through. Yeah. And uh, even though I was not a Christian at the time, I, was, I perceived I'm reading exactly what God did. And, I, and it's, it's interesting, I never questioned the actual, the, the dates and the times and the, and the, the, the length of years, etc. cetera. Um, and a lot of people today are following a different kind of uh, a blueprint, if you will, for how to understand all that material. Um, but for the person who's just reading the text, they read it straightforward. They go, oh, this is talking about chronology. So uh, you have objectives that you have developed from yes. your actual intensive study on it. It isn't just a superficial thing like in my case, but you've actually studied it. Um, let's talk a little bit about those objectives. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Uh, by the way, an anecdotal story. When I was a boy, and I didn't come to Jesus until I was 28, uh, my, my mom had this book on the shelf of great oil paintings or something like that it was called. And there was this oil painting in there of Adam and Eve in the garden. 
And in there, in the text of it, it said that Adam lived to be 930 years old. I remember that distinctly. And I don't remember like not, not believing it, mm-hmm. but not necessarily embracing it. And I was just a small boy. Uh, and so when I started, when I, after I got saved and I got interested in the subject, that memory came back to me. It's so interesting, the tapestry mm-hmm. that God weaves throughout your life, you know, providentially, even long before I confessed Jesus as Lord and was born mm-hmm. again. So anyway, same, similar to you, it, was, it wasn't something I rejected, but I didn't know anything about it. Yes. So, but to your question, so we have three broad categories of investigation that we're doing in the project. It's really important. The first category is uh, her, what we call hermeneutics, principles of interpretation. How do we interpret the text of the Bible? How, how, how do we have principles that we can apply, that we can trust, so that we're properly understanding the scriptures as God intended them? So, you know, there's many schools of thought about hermeneutics. Um, but fundamentally, what we have to always remember is that we're dealing with God's speech. Yes. Okay, and that is always the fundamental, foundational starting point. We're dealing with God's speech. Uh, the doctrine of Scripture is an important part of that. So hermeneutics is the first category. Then the second category is interpreting the text, getting into the nitty-gritty. What does the text say? Mm-hmm. What do the numbers mean? Are they, are they actual numbers? Are they intended that way? Are they symbolic? Or, right. or you know, because somebody reads that Adam lived to be 930 years old, and they go, well, that, that can't be, or wow, that's incredible. How, can, how could that possibly be? Uh, which is on the surface a legitimate question to ask, mm-hmm. you know, how, how can that be the case? So we're talking about interpreting the text carefully, very carefully, making sure that we're what we call exegesis. And then the third category, which is an enormous category in itself, uh, we have three what we call textual traditions which preserve the numbers from Genesis 5 and 11. We have what's called the Masoretic text, which is the Hebrew text. We have the Greek text. And then we have the Samaritan Pentateuch. The Samaritans had a, uh, a Torah that they followed. And in all three of them, there's differences in the numbers. And so, therefore, the chronologies are different. And so the question has been for a very long period of time, which numbers are the original ones? Why were the other ones changed? And so on. Right. So three categories, hermeneutics, exegesis, and the text. And that has been a labor of six or seven years, and I'm still not done with it yet. Very good, Henry. All right, well, I'm so glad all of you have joined us today. We've introduced this important subject of Henry's project on Genesis 5 and 11 and the chronologies there. Uh, Thanks again for joining us, and we'll be right back. In a culture of intense Bible-denying skepticism, Associates for Biblical Research exists to strengthen followers of Jesus by affirming the authority of the Bible. Our archaeological fieldwork and original research form a strong foundation in upholding the reliability of the Scriptures. For students or anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible, please visit our website and partner with us by joining our prayer team or financially supporting this ministry. And thank you for standing with us. Welcome back to Digging for Truth. We're here today with Henry Smith, and Henry and I are having a conversation about Henry's uh, project, the Genesis 5 and 11 chronologies. And um, it's important for all of you out there to, to know that you can find out everything you want to know about the project by going to the ABR website and just clicking on the banner. It says the Genesis 5 and 11 chronology project, Uh, and uh, connected to the Genesis flood, you'll see that banner on our website and you can click on that and that will take you to Henry's articles, uh, all the research that he's poured into this project. Henry, let's uh, keep moving on here. We've introduced uh, the project, its goals and its objectives. And these are, these are, these are all big things. Uh, These are, uh, you you spent just a, a minute or two explaining some of those things. 
in that short segment. And it, it, it seems to me that there is a vast amount of information behind all of that. But your research is for a purpose. Uh, recently, um, you have written articles for Bible and Spade uh, that you entitled them Wild West Hermeneutics. <laughs> And the Wild West hermeneutics idea comes out of this research on these chronologies. Uh, let's, uh, let's talk about that uh, today. Yeah, th th thank you for that, Scott. Yes, so it's a series of three articles. And uh, so I'll share some of the background for that. Okay, so you get the idea of Wild West, all right, so already in your mind you have a picture of sort of lawlessness in terms of, and, uh, in terms of uh, the idea, the picture of Wild West. And then you have hermeneutics. So interpreting the text. How do we interpret the text, not just at the micro level, but how do we understand it in the broader picture of Scripture? What methods do we use to bring to the text to understand it correctly? Mm -hmm. What do we need to understand it correctly? So now the first, the, the first thing that I'm, I'm trying to point our, our viewers to and readers of it is something that ABR has held as a distinctive since the beginning of its ministry. You know, David Livingston encountered critical arguments against the I narrative in Joshua. And he knew as a Christian that because it's the Word of God, it stands correct as written, as long as it's interpreted correctly and carefully. And there was a conflict. But he held the text of Scripture in a higher authority than the external argumentation. And we have done that historically. But we never developed it you know, methodologically in terms of spelling out what, what's the rationale, why do we differ from other evangelicals in the way our, met, our methodology is, and certainly for scholars outside the church they would operate with a totally different methodology. So what I wanted to do was lay out what, what is it we're doing, why do we feel that this is the proper approach. And so uh, when you encounter the scriptures, you are face to face with the living God. And if if you begin with a premise that's different than that, then you're going to operate with different principles of interpretation. So when you encounter the Word of God, you are encountering Him, and then in that encounter, you are bringing to that encounter your own thinking about the Bible. Maybe you're reading it for the first time, or maybe you grew up in the church and you've been a Christian for 60 years. You might be a Presbyterian or a Pentecostal or a Charismatic or a Baptist or a non-denominational person, you're bringing certain ideas to the text. And what we want to do is just step inside the text, not only the text, but its context as Scripture. And that brings what we call a correction to the way that we perceive Scripture. We get inside, we call it the hermeneutical spiral. It's not a circle, but it's a spiral. So you're stepping inside, and as you're interpreting the text, um, the Bible's teaching on various subjects is influencing the way you understand it. And so you're constantly being corrected, not by the outside authority, but the Word of God itself. Mm -hmm. So now the outside material, like archaeology, can aid us, but it never lords over the text. And so we're going to get into that a little bit where that's a, a major mm -hmm. problem. So the idea in hermeneutics is... Um, the entire council, the whole council of God, we're in that hermeneutical spiral as we're studying it. So when we read Adam's 930 years old, we're thinking about what does Paul say about Adam? What does the text say in its immediate context? How was Adam created? And so on. We're not looking at tablets from the ancient Near East first, right. or I ideas from the scientific community, right? With all those yep. presuppositions. We're looking at the text. What's going on there? So it's that kind of idea. What kind of boundaries do we need to have? And so those articles are intended to challenge the reader that those boundaries need to be from God's speech itself right. and not from external authority structures. Yeah. You call it that. And, and calling it Wild West hermeneutics, obviously you're, you're pointing out that there's some serious flaws with these, uh, this certain approaches that are taken to Scripture yes. where they're appealing to these outside historical details and making them authoritative over the text of the Bible. Yes, and in some cases making them the key to understanding the Bible. And that's a very problematic uh, method because it undermines the, the unique authority 
and ontology, the origin of Scripture. It's God's, it's the Creator's speech. So when we, when we encounter the speech of God, we're, we're engaged in an ethical act. Mm -hmm. And it's a very serious ethical act. So the method of interpretation that we use is a most serious matter. So we want to be sure that we're, we're not ignoring the outside claims about the evidence, like you know the archaeology. We do that on our show all the time. We're always talking about archaeology. Yep. But it's how do you relate it to the text? Is, mm -hmm. Does it lord over the text? Do, is it on equal ultimacy with the text? In other words, equal authority? Or does it serve as a minister to the text? And that's the view that we have at ABR. It's a minister to the text. And so I'm trying to justify in these articles why that is the superior and proper way to relate archaeology to the sacred text of Scripture. And that these other views of elevating it to equal or above actually undermine the unique nature of Scripture itself. Yes, yes. Well, it, it spawns the, this problematic approach that you're pointing out in Wild West hermeneutics uh, is, uh, there, it spawns various other problems, all kinds of interpretive problems, yes. that sort of thing. Yes. Well, uh, this is an important subject for the church. I hope all of you watching today will be we blessed and encouraged and challenged to do further study on your own. I'm so glad to be here today with Henry, and uh, we'll be right back to continue our discussion. Bible in Spade is a non-technical quarterly publication published by the Associates for Biblical Research. Written from a scholarly and conservative viewpoint, Bible in Spade supports the inerrancy of the biblical record and is a must-read for both the serious Bible student and anyone asking if they can really trust the Bible. Archaeological evidence properly interpreted, upholding the history of the Bible. Subscribe today at BibleArchaeology.org. Digging for Truth is produced and recorded in the studios of Lighthouse TV, positively different television. Welcome back to Digging for Truth. I'm here today with my co-host, Henry Smith, and we are discussing uh, Genesis 5 and 11 chronologies and uh, some of the uh, problematic hermeneutical approaches, uh, approaches to interpretation of the Bible that have been introduced uh, in the modern era. We'll just put it that way, Henry, in the modern yes. era, yeah. uh, modern critical theories of the Bible. Right. Um, we were talking about your articles and your study entitled uh, Wild West Hermeneutics. The, uh, a number of very, very poor uh, interpretations of Scripture and processes were spawned by some of these critical approaches and just the effort to replace uh, the Bible as the starting point of knowledge with these outside influences. Talk uh, to us a little bit about some of those influences. Yeah, so, so th this is outside the main area of, of the research for Genesis 5 and 11, but let's use the date of the Exodus as an example because I do that in the articles. In 1 Kings 6.1 it says, in the 80th and 400th year after the Israelites came out of Egypt, and then it gives the month and the, and the date of Solomon's reign. So it's giving you a time frame of when the Exodus occurred in relationship to Solomon beginning to build the temple. Mm -hmm. There's evangelical scholars who would say, no, 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 that 480 is a symbolic figure and the key to understanding it is evidence from the world of archaeology. So anybody who's interpreted it in the past as in the 80th and 400th year, which is what we call an ordinal number, so the time frame is actually 479 years. It's not a symbolic number, right? But what they're arguing is, in order to understand the 480th correctly, you need information from over here on the archaeological record. Now, but, but it, it's, it's, it's actually worse than that. Because what they're saying is, because the, the evidence in it doesn't speak for itself. You, you dig up a tablet, you dig up a city, you dig up inf stuff from the ancient Near East. It doesn't speak. It has to be interpreted. So what's happening is the evangelical archaeologists who are making this argument are saying the key to understanding this text is my interpretation of it. Okay, And so I lay out several examples. No, the date of the Exodus should be in the 13th century because of this evidence. 
Another scholar says, no, 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 no. It's the Merneptah stela that's the key to understanding the data of the Exodus. And we can put it in the 12th century. Okay? So the text of Scripture is dependent on the ancient Near Eastern scholars' interpretation of the evidence. So who becomes the arbiter or the authoritative interpreter of the Word of God? It's the archaeologist. It, it is, effect, in effect, what the, what the Reformation fought against. It's Rome saying, we are the key to understanding, or we have the authority uh, over, in terms of understanding the text. Instead of saying, we have these external texts, let's see how they relate to Scripture and help us understand it better. Mm. They're saying, no, no, these evidences are the key to understanding Scripture. And there's a vast difference in that, because then the authority is shifted to the mind of the ancient Near Eastern scholar. And that's a major problem. In yeah. my judgment. Yeah. Uh, what can happen uh, t for uh, Bible students, uh, students, you know, training for ministry, training, training in theology, is that they get caught up in this assumed uh, comparative uh, uh, authority, if you will, yes. of archaeology, historical studies, and then the Bible. And they get just kind of get swept into it where it's assumed that all of these sources of authority, if you will, are equal. But the Bible never says its words are the same as human words or have the authority of just human beings and their, their reasoning skills and their historical studies or their finds in archaeology. That's exactly right. And so it's, it's really important that, that, that students understand what is going on with this yeah. and how they're being kind of crowded into this these assumptions about the bible that are that are faulty yeah we're not we're not looking critically enough at the implications for the doctor, doctrine of scripture and the authority of the text yeah. is really the fundamental point we're getting at which is what you articulated now let's bring it to the genesis 5 and 11 project because the problem is wor even worse when you're talking about genesis 1 to 11 there's a vast movement in evangelicalism to say we, we, we can't take those texts at face value. Um, there are parallels in the ancient Near Eastern literature, flood stories, creation stories, and even there's even a Babel story, like a, a tongue confusion story. Um, these are the key to understanding the text. And the person probably in the modern days most responsible for making this argument is John Walton. Uh, he went on a world tour to basically tell everybody, not only have, do you, have you under, misunderstood Scripture properly, I have expertise in the ancient years in literature, I'm going to tell you how you should understand it. So everybody in the past has been wrong. But it's more than just saying that other people have been wrong. Because we always make arguments like that, you know, I, we think they're wrong, that's what you and I are saying here today. Mm -hmm. but, it, but it's something much more fundamental. What it's saying is people like Augustine and Calvin and Luther, and Basil of Caesarea, and on and on and on. Not only did they not understand the text correctly, they were never able to understand it correctly because these discoveries haven't been made until the last 150 years. Mm -hmm. So what they're saying is that the church historic and the Judaism that preceded it were cut off from the real meaning of the Word of God. That when they read it, they couldn't understand it properly. And now the ancient Near Eastern scholars come along and say, no, 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 you don't know, we know. And now we're going to interpret this evidence and give you the secret keys of knowledge to understanding the text. It's really uh, what we would call a Gnostic elitism yeah. that says this small circle of people can understand the text and you can't. And I think people intuitively listening to me lay this out can understand how deeply problematic this is, not just in terms of disagreement, but in terms of God's speech has been mumbled for millennia and no one's been able to understand it correctly. And yeah. so this is, uh, this is just hugely problematic and we need to challenge it. Absolutely. Well, I'm so glad you joined us today for this important conversation. Uh, as I'm sure you can tell, Henry and I are committed to the Word of God and we, we understand properly 
the source of the Bible, which is the very words of God. And so uh, this challenge from the, these faulty hermeneutical approaches are, are serious challenges, and we're calling them out. And we're, we're focusing particularly on the chronologies of Genesis 5 and 11. Well, thank you for joining us today. We'll be back with two more episodes discussing this most important subject. Thank you for joining us.